thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, th thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to speak at the uh, Scots Conference. Uh, there's a distinguished panel uh, from whom you have, most of whom you have heard already, and of course, uh, you've been a very patient and good audience. Uh, now, uh, I think you have heard most of what uh, can be said on the subject, and especially uh, Professor Asima Goyal's uh, lecture was very good sobering dose of uh, how difficult it is to do economic policy. Uh, and therefore one should not just uh, take it for granted that somehow you can, you can write your ticket and uh, do, uh, do whatever you like. I want to start off with a quotation from Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, as he was writing in the Ahmadnagar Fort Prison in the 1940s, he of course by that time was aware that he might be uh, the next Prime Minister of India. So he wrote something like this about the economic policy that the National Planning Committee of the Indian National Congress had uh, shaped. Uh, he says, uh, we, uh, okay. the aim was declared to ensure, to, uh, to be able to ensure an adequate standard of living for the masses. In other words, to get rid of appalling poverty of the people. The irreducible minimum in terms of money had been estimated by economists at figures ranging from 15 rupees to 25 rupees per capita per month. We calculated that a really progressive standard of living would necessitate the increase of national wealth by 500 to 600%. That was, however, too big uh, a jump for us and we aimed at a 200 to 300% increase within 10 years. We've been here before. Uh, now, the, the theme of the conference is can we get to $10 trillion by 2030? So let's do a very simple political arithmetic, a simple calculation. Uh, we are already out of 2017. So there are 13 years. Uh, the GDP right now is about two and a half trillion. So you want to quadruple your GDP within 13 years. Now there's a very simple mechanical way of finding out what that requires. The mechanical way of, of is basically you want to double and then double again the GDP. Uh, and the rule roughly is that uh, uh, if you want to double something uh, in seven years, you have to go at 10%. So if you want to quadruple your income in 13 years, the Indian economy will need to grow at 10% per year uh, in real terms. Now I think, uh, let, let, let's face it, it's, it's like, like what uh, Jawaharlal Nehru was hoping for, a 200 to 300% increase in income in 10 years, uh, it's not possible. Sorry to, sorry to break this news to you at the end of the conference. I don't think we'll get to 10 trillion by 2030. There actually is no way of doing this. In interestingly enough, uh, when, uh, when Nehru finally formed the uh, planning commission, one of the younger uh, economists uh, employed by him was K. N. Raj who had just come from London School of Economics, having done his master's degree there. And Ken Raj said to Nehru, you know, these growth rates are not possible. You can't just double income in 10 years. You know, it, it's, it's too high. Maybe you'll grow by 5%. And Nehru said, young man, you have been educated in the Western universities and you're a pessimist. You don't realize what national will can do. Well, you know, fair enough. Uh, Karaj was right. Uh, uh, Nehru actually achieved in the first, uh, first two five-year plans nearly a 5% increase per annum in real GDP. And the Indian economy did not achieve that rate for the next 20 years after his death. Uh, and it's only when uh, Rajiv Gandhi was prime minister 
that we manage better than 5% of income. So Indian economy has very few episodes of 10 years of constant growth rate at a respectable rate of, let us say, 7%. The one period, 1998 to 2008, was a very exceptionally good period for the Indian economy, partly because we had the, the fruits of reform uh, initiated by Manmohan Singh were coming through, and partly because the global economy was booming at that time. But otherwise, Indian economy has by and large not achieved uh, uh, growth rate at, at a constant rate. So what, you know, what we're really actually looking at is if we are very optimistic and you know, suspend uh, all knowledge of history, if the economy were to grow at 7% per annum, which it has sort of off and on done, but seven for 10 years, we could double income in 10 years, and then we could double income again in, uh, in another 10 years. So by 2047, I have calculated in this book, which was just uh, mentioned, but by, by uh, 2047, on the 100th year of Indian independence, we could be at 20 trillion. You know, so if we stretch the horizon, maybe we may be possible. Now, the question really is, why is the Indian economy not capable of uh, constant high growth rates? This is basically the political economy question. Because in terms of Asia, uh, India is an exception. Because the Asian miracle stories for South Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and of course, China itself has been a story of constant uh, achievement of high growth rate for a period of 10, 20, 30 years. It's capable of doing, uh, doing uh, other Asian economies have been capable of doing that. And it's somewhat independent of the political system because it has been done from democracies to dictatorships. So in a, if you say Japan, South Korea, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, there's a variety of uh, political systems there. Okay. And I think we, one really ought to ask, uh, wh what is it in India that, uh, that uh, uh, prevents this? And I think Jay Panda actually mentioned this somewhat, that basically growth is not a top priority of Indian politics. They, they really are much more interested in qualifying or uh, supplementing growth by uh, other considerations uh, such as uh, uh, redistribution or, uh, or subsidies or uh, uh, entitlements and so on. And throughout our history, uh, there has been a premature hurry to set up a Western type welfare state before the income uh, of the country was high enough to be able to afford it. Because the democratic compulsions on the Indian government are very, very strong. You know, it's, one, it's the only country, as we mentioned before, the only country in modern history which became a democracy while being underdeveloped. And it has been a very successful democracy. And as a very successful democracy, it has had to accommodate extremely strong pressures on the politicians to say, come on, growth is not just, you just can't go pursue growth. You've got to do uh, you know, various other things. And these various other things are basically uh, consumption subsidies uh, to, to the poor or the farmers or, or whatever it is. Uh, great reluctance to uh, have seriously progressive income taxes uh, and so on. And so there is a reluctance to raise resources by taxation. But there is a great compulsion to spend money on non-productive activities. By, um, I should say uh, on consumption activities rather than investment activities. And so every politician uh, to a man or a woman is very eager to give, to cancel uh, farmers' debts uh, or increase uh, the, 
the poverty level uh, above whatever it was previously, or increase the rate of uh, uh, Manrega. Uh, because this, the, somehow there's a compulsion that's, that the task of the government is to go and give money to people who are deserving people. Of course, the non-deserving people are very clever, so they, they refuse to pay the tax, which should finance uh, these, these payments. So we have a continual uh, uh, tension uh, in on, on, the, on the fiscal side. Then, so the context of, uh, of uh, political economy in India is that it is not fully committed to a growth policy, a constant growth policy which would achieve a certain target in a particular time horizon in itself. Now, why is that? Now, first of all, one has to remember that the biggest influence on Indian politics was a man who was actually totally opposed to growth and modernization, and that's Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi was totally opposed to modernization, and didn't like growth at all. His idea basically was that poverty need not be cured, poverty should be shared. I mean, his, his ideal world of what he wanted to do, uh, dismantle uh, the Congress party, have village republics and so on, have charka, great thing, you know, have you know, high thinking, plain living, high thinking. The whole strategy is growth is not necessary, might even be quite corrupting, Therefore, we really ought to have a, a you know, share poverty. And that is an extremely strong influence in Indian politics. Second influence is a great suspicion of profit and private business. Uh, I would more or less say that uh, in Indian political system, there is only a single economic philosophy. It's sort of a kajri. Uh, everybody has great faith in the ability of government to cure all problems. Uh, everybody is very hostile to private business and the profit system. They don't like markets, uh, and by and large they believe that uh, foreign capital is sort of, shouldn't be openly welcome, but I guess, you know, it'll do if it's taken it under control. So. India has no free market philosophy, uh, no party with free market philosophy, nor a party with a seriously state, statist socialist policy. It's, it's a mixture of this and that and other thing. And therefore, there is no serious economic debate in Indian politics about rival models of how to achieve growth. The consequence then is that if you want to reform the system, you can't just have one party with a majority in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha just marching the economy forward. All reform has to be consensual. Every political reform India has had since 1991. Uh, I mean, I should say parenthetically that I think we wasted 40 years after independence in, in, in a very low growth strategy, but I, but I won't go into that. But since 1991, uh, at least the last 25, year, 25 or 26 years we have had growth, it has always been a result of consensual uh, reform. And if you want to create reform by consensus, it takes a long time. Just look at the GST, how long it took India to create uh, the, you know, the goods and services tax. Uh, the debates have been going on, the formal meetings have been, now, 15 to 20 years it has taken to create a uh, goods and services tax. And all that the goods and services tax really does is make India a single market. It has taken 70 years since independence to unite India into a single market. I mean, it is a complete scandal. The European Union which is more or less a similar size uh, and it has 28 nations in it, uh, took only 40 years to make itself into a single market. And India has taken 70 years to consider a single market. And even after GST was constructed, the complaints that we heard from all political parties 
Well, okay, they're partly hypocritical, but you could not believe that all these parties had taken part in the discussion of construction of GST. So the political economy of India is actually quite hostile to, uh, uh, to rapid and constant growth. It doesn't matter because ultimately the people are willing to pay the price. No party has been voted out of office for failing to kind of, you know, uh, achieve constant high growth rates. And no party has ever been elected on the promise that forget about all these uh, transfers uh, and subsidies. We're just going to go and invest and invest and invest and achieve double digit growth rate within uh, you know, over, over the next, next 15 years. So India is, is very, is it has chosen for itself uh, a medium, medium and non-constant growth strategy because the political, uh, political uh, pressures of democratic governance are such that governments always choose to take the softer option in, uh, rather than really lay the, uh, uh, lay the law down. Uh, I will just uh, give one example and uh, then it'll sort of illustrate the thing and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, take the problem of uh, distress among the farmers. Right? We have a distress among farmers almost as a constant theme in politics. Every year, some state or other has farmers' problems. And the response usually is that farmers are indebted uh, they are in great distress, and, and there's no doubt that they are in great distress, and therefore we should write the farmers' debts off. Apart from the fact that it, it creates a, you know, what's called the problem of moral hazard, that you're actually encouraging people to get into debt again, because they know they will never have to pay the debt back, so why should they care? The system has never asked why is it that there is farmers' distress? And there's farmers distress because in other countries, China for instance, or almost every country which has come from backwardness to development, the, pol uh, the economic strategy was to industrialize very rapidly, transfer people from the rural areas to urban areas because it was always thought the rural areas had surplus labor. You could reduce the uh, supply of labor in rural areas without any effect on productivity and take these people and give them better full-time jobs in the urban areas. Yes, the first generation may have to live in slums, but the second generation is going to benefit. Th this has been a constant, uh, uh, mo most successful model of development. It was uh, pioneered by a man called Arthur Lewis, a West Indian economist. He got the Nobel Prize for it, and that model is uh, China has now reached what's called its Lewis moment. There's no longer surplus labor left in, in, rur in rural China. And so China will now have to have a different kind of strategy for growth than it has had so far. What did India do? In the first 30 years, the ambition of becoming a Soviet Union type economy, India created an industrial structure which was so capital intensive that it did not absorb any rural labor at all. It did not even absorb urban labor. All planning for the first 40 years or so did not create any jobs. The jobs which were created were by and large for skilled, educated people. So we have a very small formal sector and a large informal sector. Uh, and worse than that, 80% of Indian agriculture is of subsistence farmers. 80% of agriculture is in, of people who have very precarious living. And the whole system has at no stage faced up to the problem that the, uh, the tragedy of Indian agriculture is not something to be sentimental about. The tragedy of Indian agriculture is an indictment of the political leadership which has neglected industrialization and create the structure. And of course you've heard about labor market reform, land market reform, and so on. So all these things combined. Now, 
in no, there is absolutely no chance over the next 20 years that anybody is going to solve any of these problems. So I think India does grow. In, as Guru Charandas says, India grows at night. India, there will be growth. There will be growth roughly of 7 to 8 percent, maybe between, between 5 to 8 percent off and on over the next few years. Yes, India will get richer, but I don't think it's going to be a straight upward journey non-stop from here to there. That's not the way the country is, that's not the way the politics is, and that's not the way anybody will get elected if you promise that. So cheer up, we are like this only, and therefore we will stay like this only. But in the meantime, we have achieved which no other Asian or African or Latin American country has ever achieved. It's one of the deepest and richest political democracy the world has ever seen. And that is the success of India. High growth rate or high income is not. We'll live, don't worry.